Hello, everybody. Um, I have a difficult task to keep you all awake right after lunch. Um, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I know we have a few German people in, in the room, so I want to apologize if there was any min misunderstanding. Uh, this is not a political uh, meeting of SPD uh, <laughs> from Germany. It's something completely different. Yeah, you are disappointed, I know, but yeah. Um, I am Jean Delevar. I'm working uh, for Suze for well over a decade now, uh, trying to keep our customers satisfied. Today I'm going to speak about uh, what happens behind the scenes when you basically boot your computer and uh, the memory gets configured automatically without you having to do anything about it. We'll go for a quick history of uh, DRAM module formats. We'll then see uh, the basics of uh, what is called serial presence detect, which is what actually achieves uh, the magic. Um, we will see the specific case of the DDR4 memory because uh, it was a quite a big change uh, compared to previous generations of memory. And lastly, we will see uh, what is the Linux support for all of this. So, quick history. Um, the history of DRAM uh, gets back in the mid 70s. Uh, it was developed in Japan back then. Um, and in original computers at the time, uh, memory was soldered directly on the board. There was no slot to plug anything in, it ju just soldered. So uh, everything could be and basically had to be pre configured uh, directly at the manuf manufacturing site. Uh, you could not upgrade the hardware. If you needed more memory, you change your computer. If you need faster memory, you change your computer. Not very convenient. Then, uh, a bit closer to us uh, in the x86 world, uh, first memory modules, which you, you may have seen if you are about my age, uh, are 30 pin SIMs on 286 up to 486 computers in the 80s. Um, these memory modules had no room for configuration information. Uh, the size, the speed were not stored inside uh, inside the module. Uh, no pins were dedicated to retrieving any information. Um, so basically, hardware had to probe at every boot for how much memory was present in the machine. Uh, and anything like speed uh, had to be configured manually, typically through a, a BIOS menu. Uh, and if you got it wrong, basically, the computer would not boot at all. Um, this pretty much limited the upgrade options because uh, you could not actually foresee what next generation of RAM would be. Uh, ne next sizes, next speeds would be available. So uh, even if better memory became available while you own your computer, uh, there was no way it would be supported. Again, you have to change the whole thing. To kind of try solving this problem, uh, the memory industry introduced a PPD, which is Parallel Presence Detect. Basically, on the next generation of memory, which were 72-pin uh, SIMs, uh, as used on last generation of 486 uh, up to Pentium 2 processors, uh, they dedicated four pins uh, out of 72 to store the configuration data. It was very simple. Uh, two pins were used to store the memory size, and two pins were used to store the access time to the memory. Unfortunately, two pins is really not much. Uh, very quickly, they had to store seven different memory sizes on just two pins, two bits. And they had to store five different speeds uh, on two bits. And if you know the maths, uh, you know it's just not possible, it does not fit. Um, so as a result, machines basically had to do a mix of reading the data and then trying to figure out when several options are possible, which one is more likely to be. Uh, so they were doing a mix of reading proper data and actually doing probing as well uh, to figure it out. Uh, so. It was kind of ugly. It was good first try, but uh, not quite there yet. 
Um, because memory was growing uh, larger and larger, uh, getting faster as well, and then error, error correction uh, protocols were added, so it was one more thing uh, to let the memory controller know was available. They added up to seven pin uh, to memory models. Uh, of course, it was not compatible with previous iterations because people could not guess in advance which pin would be used for what. Uh, so it does not really solve the problem. Uh, just you're running forward and you know you will hit the wall at some point in time, just a matter of time. Also, it does not scale because uh, basically each memory module need, needed uh, a wire on the board from the memory controller uh, to, a, to a memory module. And if you have seven wires per module and you have, say, eight memory modules on your board, again, you can do the math and you see how many wires on the, on the board are needed to get there and the amount of space wasted on the, on the board. Uh, and to make things worse, uh, the future generation of memory, which is the first SDRAM uh, memory, uh, needed a lot more data uh, to provide than just access time. Uh, access time was just one of the factors. But actually, we started seeing cycle times, uh, with access time being a multiple of the cycle time, known as uh, cast lat latency. And then next generation had a lot more timings to, to let the memory controller know about. Uh, you have to select a row, you have to select a column. Uh, even before that, you have to select a bank. And there are various cases where you need to at delays at some points, and again, the memory module must be able to tell how much time it needs to cool down uh, before the next operation is possible, anything like that. You are definitely not going to store all of that uh, by using one pin of memory module for every single bit you want to store. It's going to be a disaster. So uh, the memory industry had to come up with something completely different. What they did is that they serialized the whole thing. Instead of using one bit, uh, one pin per bit, you just use dedicated pins on the memory modules, uh, which from which you will read everything you need uh, using a specific protocol. So uh, in the mid 90s, uh, with the first Pentium generation, uh, PPD completely went away, replaced by SPD, Serial Presence Detect. And with that, you have basically five pins used for configuration data. Uh, only five forever. Uh, even No matter how much data you want to add, it's just five pins are enough to do that. Two pins for the data itself, and three pins to uh, give an address to each module. So when you send a message, you tell where, which memory module you want to query information from using this address. So not only you, they serialized access to memory modules, and they also serialized the memory module themselves uh, amongst each other. Uh, some basics about the SPD implementation. So as I said, fixed number of pins, five, uh, independent of how much configuration, configuration data you want to store. Uh, no hardware probing or manual configuration needed at all, uh, because all the data is precise enough, detailed enough, uh, stored inside each memory module itself. So the controller can just fetch the information, uh, sometimes compare between the different modules and take the most common compatible setting, and then just program the controller with these settings and boot and everything will work out of the box. And a really great benefit of that is a reduced board footprint compared to PPD. Basically, we, with the previous example, uh, we are down from uh, 56 wires running on the board to just five, which is really a great improvement. In order to store the data, uh, the industry decided to use a very standard and cheap uh, EPROMs, uh, the AT24C02 uh, EPROMs which were uh, large enough to store all the data they needed back then. Uh, basically, it can store uh, 256 bytes of data uh, for everything you need. Memory type, size, timings, uh, manufacturer data, serial number, anything you want. 
Uh, these programs are really great because they are compatible with R squared C and SMBus protocols, uh, which incidentally Intel was pushing into computers at that time. Uh, the first SPD, uh, SMBus implementation is from uh, 95, I think. If you take a memory module in your hands and you look at it, uh, you will actually see the EPROM, uh, very small chip in addition to all the large chips which contain the memory data itself. Uh, you, you can actually see it uh, as circled in red on the picture. This is what it looks like on your motherboard. Uh, you have one SM bus controller which will act as the master for the transmissions. Typically, it's not a chipset by itself, it's integrated into a larger thing like either SoftRage historically or these days directly into the CPU itself. Uh, two pins are dedicated to an integrated SMBus controller. And then you have just your two wires which run to the DIMM slots and possibly uh, because SMBus can be used for a lot more than just reading uh, EPROMs, other chipsets like hardware monitor on your board. So very small board footprint. The two wires are one for the clock and then one to uh, exchange the data. The EEPROM itself looks like this, a very small chip, eight pins, uh, of, only, of which only seven are actually used. Uh, the two red pins are to power the EEPROM. Uh, the two blue pins are connected to the controller. This is the bus. And the three black pins, A0, A1, A2, uh, are to tell the EEPROM which address is uh, the one it should answer to. Um, because when the controller speaks to a memory module, it wants to speak to just one memory module and not have all modules answer at the same time because it would not understand the, the answer. Um, and so the three pins which specify the address specify only one small part of the address. Everything else is hard coded. Uh, so the, the range available is from 50 to 57 hexadecimal. So, um, again, on your board, it looks like this. Um, this is arbitrary, of course. Uh, the manufacturer could order them differently, but basically each slot has one address. So if you exchange your memory modules, you swap them. Uh, you also swap the addresses because the address is really bound to the slot and not to memory, uh, which is inside it. We have a tool in user space to uh, probe the SMBus uh, called I2C Detect. If you try to play with that, uh, you will actually see your SPD programs show up uh, as the result of a scan in the range uh, from 50 to 57. Uh, in my case, this is on a, a memory ma a machine with four memory slots, so only from 50 to 53 uh, are possible. And so you can see in this machine, I had two memory slots filled and two memory slots were empty, so no answer when trying to check for presence. And, and then after SPD was introduced, uh, there was a new iteration of the specification for every new uh, SDRAM generation, uh, DDR, DDR2, DDR3. Uh, basically with each iteration, they need a bit more storage space, uh, a bit more data to be stored because it becomes more complex to manage. And then for the DDR4, uh, they had a real problem because they had to store up to 328 bytes uh, of data if everything was filled, which, as you can understand, does not fit in, in, a, in a C02 EPROM, uh, which only has room for 256. So a big problem, how do we store uh, more data in, in the small EPROM? Well, we could compress it. No, I'm joking, it would be a stupid idea. So we're not going to do that. Um, but still, we have to find a solution, and we have to find a solution which is uh, not too complex to implement, uh, not too different from what uh, we have today. Because some one thing industry really hates is having to redesign everything from scratch. So they prefer to not diverge too much from what they are, especially for something which is for them really detailed. Um, so 
basically we need twice as much storage as we did before. The first solution, the obvious solution, would be to use larger EPRAMs, which are already on the market at the time, already cheap, popular, used for various purposes. Basically, C04 EPRAMs instead of C02. Same family, just the size above. It's been compatible, so industry should be happy. But it uses two I2 CRSs per module instead of just one, as I showed on the previous sketch. Uh, and this is not a big problem, but this is still a problem for industry because uh, it limits the number of modules on the board to uh, four instead of eight, short of using SMS multiplexing, which thankfully is not used too much and people try to avoid. And it breaks traditional addressing assumptions, which basically means they would have to rewrite the BIOS of their future machines to do things a bit differently. Uh, apparently, industry decided it was too much changes and did not go for this solution. I would have done that, you will see next <coughs> why, but uh, they decided it was not good enough. Um, so, this is what it would look like if we implemented things like that. Each slot needs two addresses. Uh, if the two addresses answer, it means the slot is used. If they do not answer, it means the slot is empty. Um, another solution which would be possible uh, would be uh, to use much, much larger EPROM, C32, uh, which can hold a lot more capacity than we will ever need for the purpose. Uh, the benefit is that it still uses one I2C address per module. Uh, so you can still have eight modules on the board. It respects the traditional addressing assumptions. So industry should be pretty happy with that, right? Uh, well, they, they would have been if it was technically possible. Unfortunately, it's, it's not. Because the messages needed to talk to this type of EPROM is not compatible with the SMBus protocol as it's defined by Intel. Uh, if we look into the details, uh, at the top is what uh, the standard uh, small EPROMs need to be done to talk to them. Uh, basically give address a very problem you want to talk to, then data address, which basically is an offset inside the memory array, uh, the, st the storage array. Um, then you repeat the address because this is how uh, I2C protocol works. Uh, and then you can finally uh, read the data from uh, the EEPROM. Uh, the diagram at the bottom is what is needed for the C32 uh, EEPROMs, which are two byte addressing EEPROMs. Uh, you still have one byte for the I2C address, but then you have two bytes to send on the wire for, uh, for the offset inside the, the EEPROM you want to read from. And unfortunately, well, there is no SMBus compatible way to do that. So industry would have to redesign brand new SMBus controller to put on all their future machines, and they did not want to do that. So they rejected also this possibility. So the GEDEC, which is the organization responsible for the world, uh, memory specifications, um, came up with a different solution, defined a completely new EEPROM standard that uh, did not exist before, that uh, would be just dedicated to this very purpose. And that new EEPROM would use paging. So basically, uh, you would access like an old EEPROM, one page, and then you would change the page and reaccess with the same process another page containing different data. This EEPROM is named EE1004. It's pen compatible with the C02 EEPROMs, which is great. It uses one main Hasquad C address per module, which is great as well. Maximum eight modules, so basically pretty much the same thing as before, uh, which makes the industry very happy. Uh, on top of that, it implements standard block write protection, uh, which can be pretty useful to avoid that people will accidentally trash uh, the contents of the prime uh, when, say, trying to write a new SMBus controller driver or things like that. And uh, yes, it does happen to some people to actually do that and to actually trash their memory, and then you can no longer use it, which is a pain. <laughs> Uh, so, block protection uh, is nice to have. 
And what they did is that they decided to use extra SQLC addresses for page selection, page querying, write protection. It looks like that on the bus. I don't know if the yellow ones are maybe not very readable. Uh, so basically, you still have on the 50 to 53 addresses the, the storage itself. And on the between 50, uh, 30 and 37, uh, you have control addresses which will be used to write protect, uh, select the page, query the page, and so on. This is what they came up with. And uh, personally, I'm not very happy with that, which I will explain why in the next slide. So we have four addresses dedicated to uh, querying, setting page protection, block protection, actually. Uh, one page is split in two blocks, so you have finer grain uh, capabilities to write protect a specific half of a page. We have one address dedicated to uh, clearing the write protection for all blocks, and we have two addresses dedicated to uh, querying and selecting which page you want to uh, read from. Uh, the thing is, all these addresses are shared by all installed memory modules. So we are actually talking about broadcasting messages on a bus which was never meant to do that. We are also talking about basically abusing device addresses to send comments instead of device addresses, which I'm not very happy about. Um, and to make things even more funny, um, address 30 is used to write protect the first block. Address 31 is used to uh, write protect the fourth block. Uh, 34 uh, for the second block or third, I never know. Well, anyway, it's not linear. It's completely arbitrary. I have no idea why they did that. Uh, but it gives a hint of what state they were in when they designed the thing, um, I think. So it uses broadcast messages for everything. Uh, and as I said, SMBus was not designed to do that at all in the first place. Uh, of course, it's fast, because you only have to send one command to change the page for all modules. You have to send one command to write protect block for all modules. Unfortunately, it's very fragile. It basically abuses uh, the i 2 c protocol, which is underlying to SMBus. Uh, it uses the validation and the arbitration uh, details of the, the implementation to do something different, which I hate. And to make things worse, uh, if you think about it, it's early extendable. Uh, they stole eight addresses in the bus for themselves, and they already wasted seven of them. Uh, there is no provision for larger variants. Uh, if you want more than two pages, uh, it's not in, in specification. So uh, we will very soon again hit a wall with the problem of uh, capacity. And another thing which is illustrated also in the next, next slide is that uh, for some reason they included useless payload in the messages, uh, which they say everybody should ignore, but the master should still send. I'm not kidding. It's in the specs. Um, so on the one hand, they are trying to optimize things, uh, even if it violates uh, the standards. And on the other hand, they are wasting cycles uh, to send data which nobody cares about. So I just don't get these guys uh, why they are doing things like that. Um, so my personal advice to JEDEC engineers for next things they design, just please keep it simple. Stick to the process, the, the standards that do exist. Stick to the hardware which already exists uh, and we already have the drivers for. Um, and things will be just much better. An example why DDR4 uh, SPD is so bad. Uh, let's say I am the memory controller uh, and I would like to select page zero to fetch information from page zero. Um, I will send my message, and uh, at the top is what uh, the first name will answer. Uh, it will hack the message, which for the DDR4 SPD, the hack does not mean I read your message successfully, which is the real meaning of that bit. It means, uh, yes, I am on page zero. 
And what the, maybe Dim2 would answer, uh, actually, no, I'm not on page zero. So uh, it will knock the message, which, as you may notice, can be distinguished from uh, actually did not understand your message and this is an error and don't do anything with me. Uh, so basically, the abuse of a protocol means that the master can't be sure uh, what it receives if it's an error or it means uh, this page is selected, which is pretty bad when you can make a difference between error and not error situations. And because of uh, the way I2C buses are wired physically, uh, when someone asks a message and at the same time somebody else knocks it, uh, the, the master sees the hack and does not see the knock. So in this situation, the master would think that everybody has successfully understood the message and that everybody is on page zero, which may or may not be the case in practice. You may think this is a theoretical example. Actually, it is a very real example. Some memory modules out there from very well-known uh, makers actually do not hack the messages even if they successfully did what they were asked for. This is what happens when you write a crappy specification and people imp implement crap on top of it. It's not really surprising. Uh, page querying suffers from exactly the same problem. Um, the master will select a page, ask memory modules to go to page zero. Uh, first memory module will say, okay, I go to page zero, I accept your command. Second memory module will say, no, I will not accept your command. Uh, uh, and the master sees success anyway, because success wins over uh, failure on the A2C bus, exactly because broadcast messages were not supposed to be used in the first place. Uh, this is a clear abuse of uh, the arbitration protocol. And then we have to write a Linux driver to support that, and it's not an easy thing because the underlying spec is crap. Coming to Linux support. So the first question, which I have seen repeatedly on forums and mailing lists, and not, not only for Linux, also for, for other operating systems, uh, do we li really need anything in the operating system to support that? Uh, actually, no, we don't need it. Uh, if all goes well, uh, the BIOS will do everything for you, configure the memory for you. This is the very purpose of SPD, to configure things for you. And you can just ignore the whole thing and never touch it. However, it's something which is good to have in a few cases. Uh, it's good to have for diagnostics. If memory does not perform as good as you think it should, uh, it's useful to actually check what detailed timings are written in it, because this is what the BIOS will use by default uh, for configuration. You can check if your various modules go well together. Uh, it's entirely possible that they have timings which are really incompatible, and the most common factor between the two is really, really low performance. I've seen that before. Uh, it's good to have for inventory purposes as well, uh, because the detailed information also contains things like manufacturer, product number, serial number, things like that, uh, which for inventory you may want to uh, be able to access. And as far as concerned, it's mostly used when I need to add memory to an existing, syst existing system, and I'm just too lazy to pull right off, open it, remove the memory modules to see what they are. Uh, you can just query through the SMBus and get all the detail, detail information like product number, uh, manufacturer and so on, so you know exactly what you have and you want to order exactly the same for maximum compatibility. You may think that uh, tools like DMI decode are good enough for the purpose. In fact, they are not. The DMI specification is uh, not detailed enough in this area. Uh, it contains some information like memory type and size, but uh, detailed timings are not there. Uh, cell numbers not there, or if it could be there, most manufacturers uh, don't actually implement it in the DMI table. So if you really want something to be sure 
that you know what memory you have uh, using the SPD protocol yourself is the thing to do. For that, you will need drivers. Uh, first of all, you will need a driver for the SMBus controller itself. And then you will need a different driver uh, to read the prompts. We have several SMBus controller drivers in the kernel for a long time. Uh, we have one for recent Intel chipsets. We have one for recent AMD chipsets, which incidentally uh, also works for all the Intel chipsets. And many others for pretty much every system out there. Uh, just look in the appropriate directory and, and you will uh, find what you need. Then we need uh, drivers for the EPROM. Um, there is a very, very old driver for the purpose, just named EPROM, very originally, uh, which comes from the LM sensor project. Back then, it was not inside the kernel. Uh, it's actually from previous century, so very old. Um, then it was integrated into kernel, thanks to Greg Krohartman. Uh, that one supports up to DDR3. And then we have uh, a much better driver for the same memory models, uh, AT24, which covers the whole family of AT24 uh, memory uh, EPROMs, including the two I mentioned before, which would have been, I think, better options to implement DDR4. Uh, this one was written by Wolfram Song, which incidentally is present in the room today. Um, also supports up to DDR3. And lastly, the last one I wrote, uh, EE1004, uh, which is needed for the new protocol for DDR4 memory models. Uh, this one is in the kernel tree since version 4.20. And the last piece of the stack you need to actually access the data is user space tools. I am only aware of one such tool, uh, but maybe there are more. Uh, the one I know of and I maintain is uh, a decode dims script written in Perl. It's not the most elegant code you have seen, but it does the work. Um, <laughs> it supports uh, pretty much all the DRAM uh, formats. Uh, I'm adding, I'm adding everything as the specifications go out. I try to to make them supported by the script. You can get plain text output from it or basic HTML output. Uh, maybe you can do a short demonstration. So on this very laptop, uh, if I run a script with the proper modules loaded, um, you basically have, yeah, it's, it's even readable. Uh, it has your memory type uh, format. So we see it's uh, sodium memory modules as uh, all laptops use, the speed at which is operates, the size, and then a whole lot of timings which you probably not care too much about. Um, one interesting thing in that example is that these two memory modules I have were ordered from the same uh, manufacturer, same company, sold under the same reference number, and as you can see, they have one timing which is different. So just because the manufacturer tells you it's the same thing does not mean it's the same thing. We had the, the example given yesterday in another talk about hard disk drives. This is the same kind of thing. Same product name officially and in practice uh, it's not actually the same. And if you look into the details, uh, well, it's of course not the same because one of the memory modules was done by Samsung and the other one was done by Inix, uh, which is a completely different company. So. They are pretty much compatible. I can't complain too much. Most of the timings are the same, but they are not exactly the same. Yes? I, th I think it's on. And so the output of DIMI decode, they are, I'll show them as being the same manufacturer? Uh, we could give it a try, actually, live. It would be fun. Uh, I don't know. On most mobile boards, uh, you have a lot of the timings that are exposed. So they are reading it from ISCRC. And while we use Diamond Decoid, it's just over uh, HT. Uh, what's this bit? Oh, right. OK. 
Um, so first lot is uh, actually yes, Samsung with a serial number uh, okay. given, and the second one is actually INX. So in this specific case, the BIOS maker did a proper job at actually filling uh, the DMI table with as much information as they could. Uh, but this is more an exception than the rule. Uh, most on laptops, it will probably work on desktop machines, especially do-it-yourself machines. Uh, you forget about it, we, you will see uh, unspecified and uh, unknown in pretty much every field here. How does it work? Does the firmware pass the inf information directly from the EEPROM and then fill the DMI information? Yes, exactly. So, okay. Um, and the HTML output is very, very basic. Actually, it's uh, plain all HTML without any style uh, on top of it. So it's functional, but it's a bit ugly. I have somewhere on my to-do list uh, an item which say uh, add a nice looking CSS to that thing, but it's very low in the list. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure when it will happen, if it will happen. We have a few remaining problems to solve, uh, which actually motivi motivated me to do this talk. Um, one problem is that the legacy prom driver uh, is causing some trouble. Uh, it's a really, really stupid driver which binds to all devices at compatible addresses uh, without even looking what is there. Uh, it's pretty slow because it scans all the I squared C bus on your machines, potentially. Uh, it's dangerous because it could probe something that does not like to be probed. Uh, it could expose to your space uh, data which should not be exposed to your space. So uh, I, I very much to very much want to get rid of a driver, uh, and the sooner the better. Especially as we have a much better driver for the same uh, type of EPROMs, um, and it becomes more urgent now because it's doesn't work with DDR4 and it even steals the addresses from the proper driver if they are loaded in the wrong order. If you load EEPROM first and then E1004, uh, the addresses are already bound to the first driver, which can do anything useful with them and the proper driver can, can no longer bind to them. So we want to get rid of that and we want instead to use the AT24 driver and the E1004 driver, which are just better. Unfortunately, these two drivers require the EEPROM devices to be explicitly instantiated. Uh, it's not automatic at all. On systems with device tree or uh, open firmware, probably it could be done by putting the proper data in, into a device tree. But we don't have that on, on x86 desktops and servers. Um, maybe ACPI could do something about that. Uh, it wasn't there last time I checked, but uh, as you know, being sure something is not in the ACPI specification is pretty tough because the spec is like uh, 500 pages or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure, but even if ACPI implements something at some point in the future, it does not solve the problem now for the hardware we have today. So I would like to, uh, yeah, that's an example of what we must do today, what I had to do before the talk, so that the demonstration would work. Uh, load the driver, check uh, which I squared C buses are available, find which one is the SM bus, and then uh, instantiate properly the, the two EPROMs uh, at the proper address. It's a tedious and it's quite error prone because the bus number depends on which system you run. It, it's not even stable across reboots. Uh, the I2C addresses depend on which DIMMs are installed and in which slot. Uh, empty slots, of course, do not have EPROMs in them. And the device name depends on memory type, which you don't know before you have access to the EPROM to read the memory type. So basically, you are kind of screwed. Uh, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, so this is not really a viable solution. It's e even scripting this would be a nightmare uh, and would not be readable. So what I have in mind and what I actually already uh, started working on is I would like it to just work out of the box in the most common cases. 
My idea is to use the DMRI data to find out the memory type because these fields are, in most cases, properly uh, filled. We would have a white list of supporting memory types, uh, not going too far in the past, uh, just supporting the most basic memory types used today. Uh, I would basically skip everything which is not standard, common. Uh, so in anything with more than four memory slots, for example, I would not deal with, uh, at least not at the beginning. And then we can even use the remaining DMI data to make decisions like, is this a laptop, is this a server, uh, is this desktop? If the DMI data looks sane, then we can make some assumptions about it and, and make the right decisions. Once we know the memory type, we could probe uh, the four first possible addresses in the SMS. Uh, because unfortunately, the MI decode will, in general, tell you how many modules are present and the type, but it will not be able to tell you in which slots they are. Or if it tells you the slot, you don't know which address is mapped to that specific slot on the board because it's completely arbitrary. So we, we still need a small amount of uh, probing, but that one is safe because if you just probe an empty slot, nothing happens. So it just a uh, yes or no answer we get, something is in or something is not in, and we can continue. That would have to be explicitly enabled in each SMBus controller driver, but we would probably put the common code somewhere else, so just one line to call if you want that enabled in your uh, controller driver. And I would keep the whole thing if SMBus is multiplexed, because first of all, it's pretty rare. And anyway, if SMBus is multiplexed, things are so complex to set up that uh, we will need a complete definition of the structure of the multiplexing anyway. So we can just as well add uh, explicit EPROM data in it as well. And then we would just instantiate the appropriate device uh, on all addresses which responded. And if that works, if all goes well, then you would be able to just run the decode dim script right after booting your machine, not doing anything else. And it would just print all the information about your memory uh, to that tool or any other tool which want to do the same. And with that, I'm pretty much done with my presentation. So if anyone has questions, two questions maximum. So would you approve of a design for a new EEPROM having like one address for the data and one address for the configuration? Well, well... So like 50, um, and 30, 50 to read out the data and 30 to set up all the pages or the write protection? That's a very interesting question actually. If I scroll a bit back, you will see that I purposely disabled a slide in my presentation. Uh, not that one, that one. So I will just re-enable it uh, for you. Uh, I uh, don't know. Uh, I'll just quickly comment on that. The, the problem sure is slide, that uh, all of this EEPROM handling logic is implemented in hardware. There is no, no microprocessor, so it has to be kind of weird like this. That's why it's so strange. I, I know why they did it. I just think that their solution is worse than the other options that were available. This is what I had in mind uh, when I saw what they did. Uh, I thought, OK, what would I do if I were them? I would basically do, I think, what you just said. Uh, keep the data address where it is for the same purpose and use one uh, extra address, one for each memory module. So this takes exactly the same amount of addresses except that we do not abuse addresses for something else. We do not abuse the protocols. Uh, we are still pin compatible. We are still uh, boot compatible in, in the same sense as E1004 uh, is boot compatible. Page zero is selected by default. So you can read the most basic data without doing any control magic. Uh, and this one is a lot more extendable than what they did. So we basically use the same number of addresses in the bus. And we are ready for 1,000 years in the future <laughs> to store everything we need instead of just two or three years as they did.
Okay, well, I think. Oh, one very last question. No, no need to be violent. I was just wondering, I, I was trying to work through it on my laptop while you were doing it, um, and I wasn't able to come up with, come up with it, uh, the decode to show any dims in my system. So like, do you, do you have any pointers to resources to look at? Uh, yeah, uh, there are a few laptops where the EPROMs are hidden. Uh, you basically have a GPIO which controls uh, a switch on the SM bus itself. Okay. which basically hides them by default. Uh, my previous ThinkPad laptop was like that. Uh, I okay. know the magic controls to switch the pin and to read it. Okay. Uh, if you send me your models of your yeah. model of laptop where it happens, maybe the same trick can work for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we are out of time anyway, so thank you.